other than Pastor David and Miss Frankie, who remembers the theme of his message last week? Temptation. I'm sorry? Temptation. Temptation, okay. Spending the word in times of trial, okay. And what would be the practical application of what he was sharing last week? What? As you're, as you're going through times of extreme suffering or trials or testing or loss, are you testing the Lord and provoking him? Or are you trusting him, believing in his glory, and then eventually all things will work out for good in the end, right? Because un unfortunately, far too many have a shallow faith in the Lord. And that as soon as the testings do come, or the trials, or the sufferings, then they suffer shipwreck in their faith. Because their faith wasn't based upon the promises of God. Their faith was based upon an unreal expectation of what God would do for us in this life. Jesus made it very clear. He said, in the world you will have tribulations, testings, trials, sufferings. You will have it. If you haven't had any sufferings yet, you just haven't been here long enough. <laughs> But you will. But he said, be of good cheer, beloved. Be of good cheer, my children. Why? Because I have overcome the world. And he truly has. And so to some extent, I want to pick up a little bit of where David left off last week as we progress in our message this morning. But looking at John chapter 17, the last verse, 26, and the last half of the verse... Jesus is praying for us. We know that in this high priestly prayer, the first third of that prayer, he is praying for himself, that he would glorify the Father in his suffering. We know that the second half of the prayer, or the second third of the prayer, he's praying for his disciples, the 11 whom he has chosen. And then he goes on to pray for those who would believe in their word through their testimony, and that would be us, the church. But he goes on to pray for us in chapter 17, verse 26, the last half of the verse, that the love, with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. What is Jesus praying? Jesus is praying that the Father's love that the Father had placed within the Son would also be in all of us and that we would be in the Son as well. The way in which you demonstrate to the world that you truly are a Christian is because what you say you believe? No. Not by what you say you believe, but how you live what you believe. And what we believe about God is the true and chief attribute of God, which is love. He not knows love, does not know God. If we are going to really demonstrate God, if we're going to demonstrate Jesus, if we're going to demonstrate our faith to the world around us, it's going to be by the expressions, the multitude of expressions of our love for him and for one another. Look at John 15 for a moment, please. Turn over to John 15. Verse 9, as the Father loved me. Jesus is speaking now. He has the Father's love. He wants the Father's love to abide in us. He wants us to abide in him. But as the Father's love, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. How do we prove that we love God? Because we say so? No, because we obey his commandments. Don't say that you love me. Don't call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I command you to do. It's hypocritical. It's nonsense. But we have a world of people, a plurality of people, a plethora of people who claim to be Christian, who would espouse his word verbally, but yet their lives display anything but true, sacrificial, unconditional love one for another. And where should that love be displayed more than any place else? At home. Where sh who should be the recipient of my love, Christ's love, the Father's love in and through me more than anybody else? My wife. And from her parents' vantage point to me. Listen, that's the real measure of your faith. That's a real measure of your Christianity, is the measure of your love. And Jesus goes on to say in this 15th chapter, verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy remain in you and that your joy may be mucho, full, grande, right? God is joy. 
How do we find joy? By being in the Father's will. When you're in the Father's will and you're fulfilling the Father's will for your life and his commandments, there's no greater joy than that. Life doesn't get any better than that, does it? You can have everything that you think you want in this world materially. You can experience every pleasure that you would desire in the flesh out there in the world, but yet there'd be no joy. And we see the amount of people today in our society who seem to have everything you could possibly want, enjoying every experience you could possibly imagine, and they are miserable. Why? Outside of the will of the Father, outside of the love of the Father. Oh, but you know when you're doing God's will, you know when you're right in the center of God's purposes and plans for your life, there is a joy that is unspeakable. You can't explain it, can you? You know what unspeakable joy looks like, right? <laughs> Verse 12, this is my commandment then. Jesus speaking to us, to you and I, this is his commandment, that you what? Love one another as I have loved you. How has he loved us? What's that word for love here? Agapeo, agapeo. Agapeo is a highest form of love. Now, some people would misinterpret the scriptures in saying that agape is God's love. This doesn't, not necessarily God's love, but is a highest form of love. It's a love that will love the object or, or the person unconditionally. There are no conditions set. I just purpose to love this and to love it sacrificially. So Jesus in John 3 said that men love agape darkness rather than the light for their deeds are evil. So you can agape darkness. And we see that happen to men and women all the time where they love their chemical addiction. Even, even beyond their own life. They love that drug of choice unconditionally, and they sacrifice their own lives and their health to receive that euphoric high. It is so temporary. Oh, there's pleasure in sin, but it's only momentary, isn't it? Yeah. But true, lasting joy comes in our relationship with the Lord, and that we're to love the Lord with an agape love, an unconditional love, a sacrificial love. For he who would seek to save his life will find it but he who loses his life for love's sake. Let me interject that. He who loses his life for love's sake will find it. If you were to step back and really measure your life, where you spend your time, your resources, your heart's real desire, the things you think about most when you're all alone, would it really be the Lord Will it really be a demonstration, a manifestation of your love for Jesus? Jesus, we adore you. Jesus, we love you. We sang that. It's easy to sing, isn't it? It's another matter to live that way. And especially if we've suffered loss, as Pastor was pointing out last week. Verse 13, greater love has no man than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. For you are my friends. How do we know we're his friends? If you do whatever I command you. I, you know, I cannot emphasize it enough. There are enough people out there who are Christian in name only. Most of those folks that you will believe, I was speaking to someone, witnessing to someone this week, and, and again, the stumbling block was, you know, do you go to church? No, I was raised in church. My parents were Christians. My parents read the Bible, but, but the, the church is full of? What's it full of? Absolutely true. Say one thing, do another. Say one thing, do another. That's, that's what it means to be a hypocrite. Posing as something you are not. No, we don't want that, do we? No, 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 no. I want to be genuine. I want to be authentic. I want to be the real thing. I don't want to play Christian. I want to be Christian. And Jesus said, I will know that I'm truly his child. I will know I'm truly the friend of God if I obey his commands. Abraham believed God, and he was called a friend of God because he acted upon what he believed. Are you God's friend? Can you say that you truly act upon what God has commanded you to do? And what is the chief commander, the number one command here in this 15 chapter as Jesus is speaking to us? Love one another. Love one another. We, we may have a wonderful opportunity soon to really express a love, one for another and for the community around us. You know, 
I'll talk more about that in a moment. But last time we were together, we talked about the fact that on this last half of that last verse of the 17th chapter, you really want to reach that vanishing point in life. What's the vanishing point? Is when all people see is Jesus and not you at all. Jesus only, you see. In your words, in your actions, your thoughts, your desires, it would be Jesus. And we talked about one man who became a Jesus-only person, and he so pleased God that he was no more. God took him. Who was that? Enoch. Enoch. And Enoch means? <coughs> dedicated. Thank you. Somebody remember? Dedicated. Enoch means dedicated. He dedicated his life, his heart, his living to the Lord, and he so pleased the Lord by his walk of life, he reached that vanishing point where it was no longer Enoch, but it was God's glory that was being demonstrated, and he was no more. Hey, our salvation begins with our justification, right? That's a forensic term, a legal term, where God looks upon you just as if you've never sinned. Impossible, though, that we have sinned. But Christ alone declares us justified, righteous. So it's a declaration, righteous. But then we go through this process of living we call sanctification, where we're progressively becoming more and more righteous. The salvation, salvation, justification, sanctification. But then ultimately, one day, one day we'll all reach that vanishing point. One day we will be in a glorified state. We call that glorification. A pointed righteousness, a progressive righteousness, and then one day actually being in the state of righteousness. Where our existence is manifesting the glory of the great mysterion of Colossians, the most Christ-eccentric book in the whole New Testament. The great mystery of Colossians is Christ in you, the hope of... And what did Paul mean by that? That right now, listen, right now in my flesh, in my living, I can live such a way under the power of the Holy Spirit where the love of the Father is given to me, the person of Christ lives within me to the glory of God. Do you understand? Doesn't that make you happy? Doesn't that excite you? You can live for the glory of God. Yeah. And that's what we want to talk about. We, that's what we were started to talk about last week, reaching that vanishing point, when you know you've really apprehended the love of God, or more importantly, the love of God has apprehended you. It's demonstrated in a multitude of ways in your life. Where did we look at last, last time we were together? It wasn't last week. It was the week before. I'm so grateful you remember everything. Romans chapter 12. Turn there. Romans chapter 12, talking about offering yourself for love's sake, unconditionally and sacrificially as a burnt offering, a sacrifice unto God. Jesus Christ offered himself as a burnt offering, a holocaust unto God, right? Because the burnt offering in the Old Testament was called a holocaust. Why? Why? That entire offering was consumed on the fire. It was exceptional to every other offering because most of those other offerings were consumed by the priest and the, the worshiper. But in the burnt offering sacrifice, the entire animal was consumed on the fire. It's called the Holocaust. And the animal was dismembered. And all those dismembered pieces were placed upon the altar and then it was extinguished as Christ's body was mutilated suffered and died. He was the Holocaust, the burnt offering for my sin and yours. And now all he asks is that in exchange that you would offer your life for his. He's not asking you to die. Oh, that may be the case. There are many Christians who have died for Christ in their faith. But he's asking you, more importantly, would you live for him now? And that's what he's talking about here when Paul writes in chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, your reasonable act of divine service or worship. So if we are to worship God as we are intended to, as he wills us to, then we would offer ourselves. But the only way I can offer myself is through the mercy of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present yourself. Why? You'll never do it in the flesh. It's not innate within you to want to devote yourself to Christ. It's not innate within you that you'd want to devote yourself to anyone else. Why? Why are so many marriages end in divorce? Because it's self-centered. It's not what the individual could give in the relationship, but it's what they could take. 
what they could receive. And as soon as it's not meeting my need, as soon as it's not making me happy anymore, it doesn't bring what I desire, then it's over. They call it quits, right? The same way in our relationship with the Lord. You know, we really can't be offering ourselves to God in the way we should without God's empowerment of the same. It is God who works within me both to will and to do. By the mercies of God, I can present myself a living sacrifice. So what's my part in this? Pray. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Lord, take my life and use it for your glory, Lord. Transform me, Lord. That metamorpho, that metamorphosis, where we're transformed from one being to another. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Can you display to the, have you displayed to the, can you give testimony? More importantly, can those who know you most intimately give testimony of a transformed life? That it's no longer you that they see, but they see Jesus in you. This is exactly what Paul is describing here in this 12th chapter. And do not be transformed to this world, but be do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And may you prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Two weeks ago, we went through this text. If you want to go into it in a little more depth, go back and listen to the, the message. Verse 3, for I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly as he ought, but to think soberly as God has dealt each one a measure of faith. If whatever we have received it is from the Lord, hasn't it? Every breath that we take in, it's a gift from God. God has given us our gifts, our talents. He's given us our intellect. God has fashioned us exactly who we are, given us the measure of faith to accomplish the purposes he has for each of our lives. Each of us is a tool that God has created to be used for his glory and for the good of others, for the increase of his kingdom, for the blessing of his church, that we become a part of the body serving the whole rest of the body, you see? That's what he's referring to here. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who thinks among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, all of the members do not have the same function. For we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering or teaching in teaching. If he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. You see what Paul is talking about, the unity that exists in Christ, but it's a unity through diversity, Right? We become that one perfect body through the diverse gifts that we offer one to another in the body as we come together. My body has many different members, doesn't it? All the members don't have the same function, same giftedness, same purpose, but all of them work together for the health of the rest of the body. And when it doesn't, you know it, don't you? And some of those lesser gifts that we don't pay too much attention to, boy, when they stop working, you really have a problem, don't you? Hmm? <laughs> but some of, the, some of the members of the body that we place the greatest honor upon really doesn't serve much of a function at all, does it? How much time do you spend on hair products? Arranging your hair, getting your hair done. Woohoo, you know? <laughs> How much time do you fellas buff buffing the body? I mean, you, you know what I'm talking about. Those are the lesser, less important, right? but giving importance to the important members of the body that are necessary for the function of the body and the survival of the body. The maturity that comes in the body of Christ is as we recognize, I need you. And you need me. We have differing gifts, talents, callings, but together we make the perfect one of the body, you see should be no division among us. No, but it should be the unity that we recognize. It should be our differences that we celebrate. Just as in marriage, we, we don't believe in egalitarianism in marriage, do we? What's egalitarianism? I'm sorry? Well, that's it. That's it. <laughs> well, that, we, you know, you could get there. <laughs> but you took the... You <laughs> Sorry. 
Part of the curse in Genesis 3, actually it's 316, is where God said that uh, your desire shall be for your husband. You think he's so cute, he's so strong, he's so smart. That's not what it means. <laughs> it means her desire will be for her husband, but he shall rule over you. In the Hebrew text, a woman's innate natural desire, I'm not fleshly desire is that they would dominate and control the situation. They want to usurp their husband's authority and his responsibility. Now, that's the battle of the sexes. You need to understand that. When you get into marriage, uh, Andrew, are you out there? Kaylee? Yeah, you listening? When you get into marriage, the battle of the sexes is that, you know, you need to understand what's innate within us. Now, innate within a man, the monster within the man is what? His ego. It's ego. Ego can be a beautiful thing that God will use to really advance his kingdom, his work. But it can be a horrible thing. Man's pride and ego swells, just as a woman's desire to control and dominate, okay? So we don't believe in egalitarianism where we're equal. We are equal before the cross as individuals, but our responsibilities, our job description, our purpose and calling is very different. And therefore, we believe in the church in complementarianism. I, you know, I can spend a lot of time with the fellas, and we very rarely have a disagreement or an argument. <laughs> Just get me in the car on 385 with my wife. <laughs> but we complement one another. It's not meant to bring division. It's not meant to bring conflict. It's meant to bring wholeness. There's a whole half of me that's missing found in her. There's a whole half of her that's missing found in me. Pastor David and I, we're the same half. Bring these two halves together. We're still that half that's missing a lot, right? It wasn't Adam and Steve. Right? But two women together, halves of the same kind. You still are only a half, right? Oh, but when you have a man and a woman who come together, right, Bill? A man's incomplete until he takes a wife. And then he's finished. He's finished. <laughs> no, he's made whole. He's made whole. I don't want to go too far on that. I'm getting off on my text. Okay. Verse 5, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of each other, having then di gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, then let us use them accordingly. Now, verse 9 through verse 21 is what I want to focus on right now. This is where you can give evidence of the fact that you're reaching the vanishing point. This is where you can give evidence of the fact that you really are allowing your life to be possessed by the love of God. That Jesus' prayer is being realized in your life as he prayed, Father, may your love be in them as it is in me, and may I be in them as well. So you want to demonstrate that you truly are in Christ? It'll be demonstrated in the many different aspects of love that are manifest in your life. Everybody here South Carolinian? No? We got some foreigners among us? Yeah? Are you South Carolinian because you say y'all? No, you're South Carolinian because you, you reside in South Carolina. And therefore, why are you a Christian? Because you say so? Because you speak Christianese? No, because you reside in Christ, and you reside in his love. You understand? He who knows not love knows not God, for God is love, his chief attribute. Now, let's go through this list quickly, because I want to show you a video this morning, and I want you to just, just this is all for self-examination. You are not to use this against your spouse. Okay, do you hear me clearly? You're called not to judge anyone but yourself. Yourself. Okay, so let's look at this. All right, verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. It needs to be a genuine love, a true love, not a love that says, what can I get out of the relationship, but what can I give? As Christ's love was demonstrated in us, right? You know, God loves you more than you'll ever love him. You understand that? He said, be anxious for nothing. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, many mansions. And if I go, I go to prepare one for you. And where I go, you know, and the way you know, right? Now, Jesus not only loves us more than we will ever love him, he wants you in heaven more than you want to be there. Do you believe that? 
Do you? It's all true. He desires you to be where he is. That's what he said in that 14th chapter. And where I am there, you may be also. So I'm, I'm holding dear to that promise. I know one day I'm going to be where he is with him. Yes, let love be without hypocrisy. Let it be genuine. Let it be true. Let it be God's love working through you. Abhor what is evil. Wherever your flesh has entertained evil and desires evil, you need to pray and ask God to remove that. Remove that taste, that appetite, that desire completely from you. Abhor it. I have said to you many times before we have a communion, we do communion here the first Wednesday of every month. It's the most worshipful thing we do when we come together for the Lord's Supper, for communion. And I encourage you all the time to continually ask God before communion, what is it I find acceptable in my life that you find detestable? Lord, show me. Show me what it is, Lord. What attitude? What action? What desire? Abhor what is evil. And then like super glue, what? Stick to what is good. Cling to the good. Yeah. Oh, you want to be like Christ and that you do always those things that please the Father. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another. This is a family love he's talking about here. And then he says to one another, not only be kindly affectionate, but with brotherly love. This is a fraternal love. We're brothers, we're sisters, we're family, right? We're joined together. In honor, giving preference to one another, esteeming others higher than your own self. Don't think more highly than you should. Don't be prideful, but be humble. Be a humble person. Now, I'm not talking about someone who's weak, but meek. What's meekness? Power, power under control. Power. Jesus had all power in heaven and earth, didn't he? Moses, such a powerful man being used of God in so many powerful ways and demonstrating the power of God and the miracles he would perform. And yet the Bible tells us he's the meekest man in all the world. Yes, be meek, not prideful. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Not lagging in diligence. Don't be lazy or slothful. God wants us to be enterprising, working hard. Be fervent in spirit. And we talked about that briefly a couple weeks ago. That means to be boiling hot for the Lord. Jesus said to the church there, Laodicea, in uh, the Revelation, he said, I wish that you were either hot or that you were either cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I can't stand you. Nobody likes lukewarm water, do you? No. I'm, whew, working out in this heat this week, boy. You know, I mean, I drink more water than a camel, you know? But I don't want that water lukewarm. Even when you're perspiring profusely and it's so hot out there, if you get a glass of lukewarm water, you don't even want to drink. Spit it out. But a cold glass of water, oh boy, how refreshing that is. He said, I wish that you were hot or that you were cold. If you're cold, you're refreshing. If you're hot, you're therapeutic, right? And then God wants us to do both, to be therapeutic in people's lives, and to be refreshing. As the Holy Spirit is working through us. Yes, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Who's in charge, you or the Lord? The Lord. Yeah. Your prayer life, is it a bunch of wish lists, uh, requests that you make to God, or are you really submitted and ask God, just Lord, do your will in my life? Make me a servant, humble and meek. Help me be the one who would strengthen the weak. Lord, help me to be your eyes, your ears, Lord. Help me to be your hands, your feet, Lord. Help me to be your heart, Lord. Too often our prayers are so self-centered, so preoccupied with self. You have to pray long enough where you get beyond all of that and you start allowing the Holy Spirit to pray through you. And then your prayers become, like Jesus, they're completely other-centered. You disappear. And the true desires of God appears in your life. The number one prayer that would be prayed always if you're praying in God's will would be what? The salvation of souls. The salvation of others is God's first and preeminent concern, and his glory would be seen. Yeah. Steadfast. Serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Hope is an absolute assurance of the things that God has promised us. Peter was the apostle of hope. He would constantly remind us of that blessed hope that we have. One of the blessed hopes I have is in the Lord's return. 
I hope you do too. Now, it's an assurance. It's an absolute. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. September 25th. What's that? Yom Tara, the Feast of Trumpets. September 25th, 26th. So who knows, right? Who knows what September may bring? But boy, we have so many blessed hopes that the Lord has placed upon our heart. But first and foremost is being with him for an eternity. Going through the tribulation of this world. And we, we don't suffer, really, do we? Not here. <clears throat> patient in tribulations. The word patience, hupomone, what does it mean? To stay under the trial, under the testing, under the tribulation, the suffering, not cutting and running, but, but allowing God to do all that he desires to do as he brings about this trial, this suffering, this testing in our life. And it's always for two purposes. What are they? Our maturity and God's glory. The sufferings that we go through in this life, because we will have tribulation, but we can go through that suffering in such a way that, that it not only matures us as Christians, recognizing that your glory, Lord, is what I will live for, no matter what the suffering or the pain, until you come, until I reach my end. Hmm? Patient in those tribulations. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. This is a constant acknowledgement of God's presence and speaking to him all day long. Not just at uh, specific prayer times that you've established during your day, although you should have those. Distributing to the needs of the saints, recognizing that there are many in the body who have needs, and we want to help meet those needs. And not just physical needs, though, emotional needs, spiritual needs, relational needs, whatever it might be. Given to hospitality, opening up your heart and your life, your home, your table. No, no better way to get to know somebody than when your needs are under their table for table fellowship, right? I'm sorry, I'm not available for lunch this week, but talk to my people and... We can arrange something, you know. <laughs> Given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. That takes the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, of course it does. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Yeah, Americans love success, don't we? We just hate successful people because in your flesh you're envious, right? Who won the giant lottery this week? Was it 700 and some million dollars? I don't know. Somebody win it? I didn't win it. I didn't buy a ticket. You know? <laughs> yeah, but do you rejoice with those who rejoice? Are you, are you really glad for everybody else's good fortune? And, and do you have compassion and mercy? Do you weep with those who weep, those who sorrow? As God has comforted us and taken us through our various trials and sufferings, we can comfort others with the same comfort that we receive from the Lord as he works through us. My good friend who's passed away and I went up and did his memorial a few weeks ago, his widow is just so grieved and I understand exactly what's happening in her life. It's a tremendous pain that's been afflicted upon her that will take some time to heal. But I'm thankful that Gail and I can talk with her and talk from experience about how over time God will heal that pain. It won't be so cute. Normal never comes back. You never get over it. But you learn to be thankful that God has taken them to heaven to be with him. And one day we'll all be together. Yes. The various sufferings. And we comfort one another. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Again, don't be prideful and haughty, arrogant. Don't seek any position of high authority or esteem. In those testings that the devil brought about to Jesus after 40 days in the wilderness, what were they? Physical suffering. Right? He was hungry. He had fasted for 40 days. And as David pointed out, Pastor David pointed out last week, you know, uh, after so many days of fasting, you're not hungry anymore. But when that hunger pain kicks in again, that, that's the last stage before you expire, before you die. You need to get nourishment. And that's where Jesus was. And so he was tempted by the devil to satisfy his own needs for bread. But Jesus made it clear he lives by the word of God. 
Not by physical bread, but the bread of the word. Second temptation, what was that? The kingdoms of this world and all of its riches. Did Jesus not come to become Lord of the world? The king of glory? Did he not come to do that? But he wasn't going to do it Satan's way. He was going to do it God's way. Not by bowing down and worshiping Satan. Manhattan. The Isle of Manhattan was sold for some trinkets, some beads, and blankets. The treasure was given away. Hmm. That's what Satan offers, trinkets for the treasure of your soul. Jesus said, no, no. Nevertheless, thy will be done, Father. And he did purchase the world, but through the giving of his own life. He is the king of glory, and he is the king of this world, and he's going to come and take possession of that which is rightfully his. But he wasn't going to do it in a cheap way. And the last temptation? Jump from the pinnacle. Why? Sensationalism. <laughs> Celebrity Christianity. Become a star. The hero. No. It was in his humiliation that he received honor. And so we want to seek the honor from the Father, not the honor of men. Repay no one evil for evil. I've, ha I've had to learn that lesson. Gr growing up, I had a difficult time when I suffered any uh, rejection or when people would do me ill will. I uh, lived to the code that if you did me harm, I did you twice as much harm, so you'd never even think about it again. That's no way to live, is it? So what are we supplying to the Ukrainians now? Longer range missiles, more powerful missiles. Why? So you more destruction. When will it all end? This bloodshed of man, shedding the blood of man, began with Cain and Abel, and when will it all end? When Jesus Christ returns, when Shar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, returns, then there'll be true peace on the earth. So unnecessary. Yes. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if it is possible, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. We're not, listen, we're not always going to agree, are we? You know, if you don't believe that, get married, right? <laughs> But you, you learn to work it out. You learn to negotiate. You learn to compromise. You, you, you learn to work together. You know, I was sharing with the fellows yesterday, in my 37 years of marriage with my first wife, I don't think there was a handful of times I had to make a decision that we didn't agree upon. Most of the time, if we didn't agree, we just put the decision aside. Right? And, and even with Gail, you know, there are times when, there are times when we don't agree, isn't there? Yeah, are you sure about that? <laughs> sure there are. But we, we purpose to pray and ask God's will. And if the decision doesn't have to be made, we'll put it aside. If a decision has to be made, well, I have to make that decision. And then, and then the heavy weight of responsibility falls upon me, because what if I made the wrong decision now? I not only have to answer to my wife, I have to answer to her father. Right? Mm. Yeah. Be a peacemaker. Be called the sons of God. 19, beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. As the Lord told Israel in Exodus, for the Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Therefore, verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire upon their head. And that was an act of kindness, too, putting coals upon their head so they could start their own fire. They would come and take coals from your fire to start theirs. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil. But how do we overcome evil? With bigger weapons, right? Missiles that go farther, bombs that have a greater capability for destruction. Is that how we do that? Overcome evil with what? Yes. Good. Are you sure? Um, the flyover country in America. What is that? They call it the flyover country. Do you know? 
in the, the middle of America, middle of America. What, what, why, what, why do the people on the West Coast and on the East Coast, uh, particularly in these liberal cities, why do they hate the flyover of middle America? More conservative, yeah. They're, they're God-fearing. God, guts and guns, they talk about, right? They're courage, they're patriotic, they, they have a faith in God. Hmm? Now, what, what is it about those people that is so different, extremely different from the people on the coastline? I'm sorry? They're all about sell. They're all about sell. Okay, but, but what, what the basic difference is in the flyover country, they're farmers. Mm -hmm. hard workers. They're hardworking. They work the land, close to the land, close to... You know that, right? Because, because there's, there's so much that they can do, but then they're so dependent upon God for so much of everything else. Farming is a very, very difficult life. It's a tough life. And, and you're investing heavily in a hope for the future, for a crop or a harvest or whatever it may be, and then you become completely dependent upon God to provide what you need. Not, not too much rain, but enough rain. Not too much sunshine, but enough sunshine. We don't want a drought. You know, and, and so that middle America, they're very God-fearing people, farmers, historically, those who work the land and have their lives invested in agriculture or in raising lives. You're very close to God because you understand the necessity and the dependence you have upon God. In the Ukraine, what was the Ukraine known for as far as their production or what they offered to the rest of the world? They were the, the bread, the, Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. That's what they were called. And, and now this week, uh, Russia has agreed to allow them to, to begin grain shipments again. Uh, most of the grain of Europe comes from the Ukraine. And that basin is so fertile. Now, also, Ukraine is known as the Bible Belt of Europe. Did you know that? Ukrainians, many of them believers. The working people, the farmers, the villagers, great faith in God. Billy Graham Evangelistic Association has been ministering over there since the early 80s. Billy Graham himself went over there several times. Huge revivals and crusades that would take place. And many, many of the Ukrainians have a deep faith in God. And now you have to ask the question, well, where's God in all of what's going on now? Let's see, you mentioned something last week in your message. Uh, Mesa, Merba, where was that? Yeah, in the desert. Yeah, Exodus 17, go there. It was in the desert in Exodus 17. Exodus chapter 17. What, what is your going to reaction going to be if we would suffer the fate of what the, our Ukrainian brothers and sisters are suffering today? If we would suffer what the church in Ukraine is suffering today, what would your reaction be? What would your response be? Well, would you be testing the Lord, having contempt for the Lord, provoking the Lord, or would you surrender and bow your knee to his sovereignty? Well, we would like to think that, wouldn't we? I, I would like to think that God would place that within my heart. You know, I only need the grace when I need it. I won't get it ahead of time. But boy, I sure pray for it now. As the children of Israel were suffering need, they had contempt for the Lord. Read the text. Chapter 17, verse 1. All the children of Israel set out in their journey in the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and encamped at Rephadim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you, why are, do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Well, that's a way to give God gratitude, huh? They were slaves. They were in bondage. They were in Egypt. He broke their chains. Don't you love it when we sing that part of the song, that chorus, where, where all my chains have been broke? I know how, how much bondage I was in for 30 years of my life. And he's broke those chains and continues to praise God. And do you think he, he, he saved you so that he could destroy you? 
Is that what you think, Israel? I brought you out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of this servitude, so that I could destroy you and your children and all, the, all that you have, your livestock? How ridiculous. But that's, that's a contempt that they had for God. That's how they tested God. They provoked God. And God allowed that entire adult generation to perish in the wilderness. And who did he bring into the promised land? Their children that they said God was going to kill. Wow. Ungrateful for all that God has done for them because they're suffering a little bit of thirst. So Moses cried to the Lord, verse 4, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river. And go, behold, I will stand before you on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Wow. How God provided for them miraculously. Even they were so ungrateful. But God still provided, didn't he? Yeah. We live in a world that is so, we live in a society now, a nation that is so ungrateful for all that God has done for us. But he is still providing, isn't he? The sun rose this morning. It's been raining nicely this week. Greening everything up. And you know what all of this represents. Paul talks to the first Corinthians about the fact that that rock was Christ that was smitten. When Moses took his staff and he smote the rock, it was, it was a demonstration or a symbol type and sign of Christ being smitten. When the rock was smitten, what came forth? The living waters of the Holy Spirit into the lives of everyone who would believe and drink deeply, freely. Hmm? And so that rock was Christ. And when he smote that rock, there was some uh, artesian well, something underneath that rock where it just burst forth, and it was enough wa water to hydrate them and their livestock and abundance in reserve. But they were so ungrateful. What does the text tell us? Look. Verse 7. And so he called the name of that place Mesa and Mirabah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they had they had tempted the Lord God, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Mesa means testing. Merabah means provocation. They tested the Lord. They tempted the Lord to the point where they provoked the Lord. They had contempt for the Lord. Whew. That'd be a dangerous thing to do, wouldn't it? And what was the result for that generation? They never entered into the promised land. They wandered in the wilderness, in the desert, for 40 years until that entire generation had passed away. What was the question they asked at the end of that chapter? Where's the Lord? Where's the Lord? If you were a Ukrainian Christian and your church has been bombed and destroyed and leveled, many of the people that you know had to flee with a suitcase, very few belongings. Many of them died. I wonder what you'd be asking. Where's the Lord in all of this? My son just came back from the Ukraine last week, and Mike Wingo, many of you know Mike, he came back yesterday from being there for three weeks. And both of them said the same thing. It's been a life-changing experience. It's been life-changing to see the glory of God lived out in his people who have nothing now. Nothing. I'm going to show you a video clip. It's 28 minutes. Absorb what is being shared here. It's the people of God, the church, not a building, but the people, the church, expressing the glory of God and living in an abundance of love and demonstrating that love in the way they're giving of themselves for the glory of God. It's amazing. I, I would pray. Now, you do know that the Bible predicts that there's a coming, a shaking, a trouble, a ruin to this world that will affect the entire surface of the globe. Who knows but God if we would not experience some of the same fate and troubles and testings that they're suffering there? Who knows but God? I would pray to God that our reaction would be like many in the church in Ukraine. It's going to be a wonderful opportunity for the church to shine, to glorify Christ, to express the love of Christ more than ever before. Go ahead, Dan. 